Right, uh, welcome back to J Wildfire, everyone. This is Martin Flink. He's going to take you on a very quick tour of the animation features inside. Andreas Maschke, who is the developer, uh, has been working on this for free for years and years, and now he's looking for a little bit of help to get the GPU rendering set up so that we can get nicer feedback in the editor, so previews and so on when we're moving things around, as well as dramatically speed it up output. The rendering is what the problem is with these things. Generally speaking, you can have a render take up to hours and days for one image, depending on what kind of resolution you're working with. Now, the same image could take seconds if you use a GPU-based uh, graphics card. And that's what we're looking at, rewriting the software to work with a GPU graphics processing unit, which means that you can take advantage of all the built-in computing power that's on modern graphics cards today. Anyway, quick um, discussion about what I'm actually working on. Right now, I'm working on a 1280 by 720, which is 720p resolution, which is normal standard HD or half HD, as you can call it. Uh, I can run this to anything, and if I don't have something like here, for example, full HD, uh, if I don't have a setting for something that I want, uh, if I want to go pre print size, I can set up anything, whatever resolution you want. Uh, it's only limited to the amount of RAM you have. So generally speaking, more RAM you have, the bigger the images you can render. Now, into the animation features. Here I have a Xenomorph, we call this type of fractal. We can generate them freely uh, and easily with the random generator. Uh, we can go through all these types of fractals here very quickly and just create a whole batch of them. It's super easy. So if you're stuck for a little bit of inspiration or you don't know diddly squat about fractals, go with random and play around with it. It's super simple. Animation features, right? So I wanted to animate this one, show you what I can do for a quick uh, video loop, something like that. I clicked on the animation button here, set the frame count from, uh, it defaults at 300 frames, could be anything you want. Uh, I set it to 120 and at 30 frames a second, that's like four seconds of animation. So I've already set up this animation. As you can see, it's not as fast as all that because it has to run using the CPU, actually the processor on the computer. So this is basically stepping through the fr uh, frame by frame. Right, so, so that's kind of an animation where I've kind of animated just a couple of parameters to kind of get a bit of movement in there. And uh, so I can just give you some something to look at. As I said, I can animate any feature, any of these parameters, variables here. Here's These are the formulas that are attached to this particular um, transform, as we call them. You can move these transforms around by just grabbing them and moving them. But anything you do can then be animated, right? So once you have this button switched on, most most everything has a little kind of graph looking thing here, right? A little spline on it. And by clicking on that, making, you know, once, once you're using it, it turns into red, the color, and the buttons, you can see it's actually being used. By the way, if you don't like the interface, very quickly, go to the UI theme. Nimbus is the default. If you like kind of a black in interface, a bit of darkness, a bit of smooth, you know, video guys tend to like this type of thing. You can do that, save and close. But for videos and things like this uh, recording, it's better to just go with some uh, plain and simple like this one. Right. So what do these animations do, the animation values? Uh, let's just uh, go here and drag back the thing. You can basically step through this with your keyboard as well if you want. So click on a spline or anything that you haven't got a spline on. What I've done here is I've just basically clicked in. And as you can see, there's a tiny value here. Right. Uh, let me see. Where are we? Yeah, this one here is set to zero at this particular frame. I can have a look. You see sort of a little preview here what happens, what that thing does to the flame. And you can basically drag this and you see an interactive kind of preview. Again, this would speed up an awful lot when you're using a GPU acceleration setup. Now, these could be, uh, as I have it here, Bezier, or they could be spline interpolation or linear. Right, I'll show you how to set up a spline one in a second. And on top of that, I also use, in the affine transformations, I use the rotation, as you can see here. So this one here is, um, it's got a bit of a spline on it. And as you can see, spline points are directly attached to the curve. And if I go here and sort of show you what it does, 
So this is basically just rotating that particular transform. And to find out what you're doing, what you do is you basically go in and you can switch on to rotate. So when, you, when you're when sort of going through a flame, you basically just play with the different controls and see which one you want. And then once you, once you have it, you decide which one you're going to use. All you have to do is just click on the animation button, go in and set uh, the actual uh, animations on that particular feature. And that's it. It's as simple as that. So to add another animation here, let's see what we can do here. This one, I can't see the control of it. I'll just zoom out a little bit. So we're going to zoom out till we see the triangle. There you go. Right, and yeah, okay, I'm going to use try to rotate on it. What's it do? Oh, it kind of creates some interesting things. That's nothing particularly exciting about it, but, you know, I might animate that. So, all I have to do is just click on it, opens up the spline editor, add a point. Now, this one, as I said, is 120 frames. So, add a point around 120. If you want it to be um, a looping animation, just set it so that it's slightly before or after what you start off with. So, this value here was... Um, as we can see here, value zero. So I might, depending on what sort of um, movements I'm going to do here, uh, this is also going to be at frame 120. So let's put it at frame 120 and view all. Okay. So I'm going to add some points here. And then we can just see what we're going to do here. It's not a lot, right, as you can see, because we're zoomed in quite a bit. The first one was scaled to value of half, uh, you know, half a degree. So let's change the value range here. So go between 100, minus 100, and positive 100. Right, now, let's work with that instead. So let's see what that does to the animation. And add another point here. All right, it has a bit of fun with this shape in here in particular. Right, so, uh, and then as I said, if you put this so that it's somewhere not quite at the same, but close to the same value, you will end, you will end up then with something that basically uh, has one kind of frames worth of movement missing so when you come back to the f start when you're looping it will be pretty seamless right but it's on the way to that v value now and by not actually putting it at exactly that value you don't get two frames that are identical that's the important thing about animation and you can do it fairly loosely uh, do a couple of tests and see what you'll come up with anyway if I play that now this is what I'm ending up with And as you can see, we have a bit of motion blur going on. That's adjusted in here. Down here, we have all these extra settings. So I've that is already selected. And the blur length here starts off at zero. Um, I've set it to 3.8. If I put it back to zero, you'll see um, in a second that'll basically reset itself. So if you play that again, you'll see that the blur has been taken taken out of it. Yeah, sure, the image is a bit blurry because we're using a sort of a preview, very rough um, kind of thing. Now, if you bring on the blur length, by just moving the slider to somewhere where there's a fair bit of movement, now when I adjust the blur length, you can sort of see how it will impact. You see the movements here because these things are spinning and so on, right? Now, blur lengths should normally be fairly small. Too heavy a number make things look a little bit wacko. But again, you can create really cool effects with that as well. So bring it on. Not a bother, right? 
Okay, folks, before we leave this exciting part of J Wildfire, what I wanted to show you as well is that any of your parameters that can be animated can also be animated based on sound input, sound sync. Now, if I wanted to animate this uh, rotation parameter here for uh, transform 2, which if you want to know which transform you're working on, you can basically just sit here and play with them. Um, you know, so this is rotate mode. So if I wanted to just rotate it, I can see what happens when I rotate. So this is how you figure out which parameter to play with before you start playing with them or before you start assigning them to some kind of parameter animation. Anyway, so I just wanted to show you very quickly that we can do this in Dancing Flames as well, but this is the fact that you can actually use them inside here as well. So pick any old MP3 file, sit back and relax. It takes a while to basically analyze the the frequencies and um, there you have it so we can see here that we're starting off with nothing happening at all here we can change things like the duration here frequency band and the frames per second we're using here to analyze it now I can see that we're starting off with this frame here frame 20 so there's nothing happening until that so let's get rid of everything up to that point and let's move this frame uh, over or this uh, particular thing over here maybe uh, add a point so you can edit all this stuff just like you would anything else right now you can also go in and edit you know these things and re you know reset and whatever and do whatever add another file and so on and re uh, reapply uh, you can also import and export these kind of um, data files like all these blinds and stuff you can export them and you can also export to clipboard that means you can import in, in a different um, in a different flame if you want later and that's it so let's apply that and close and see what it does from here so now we have the actual animation done according to whatever the sound we want to animate to the sound file we want to play with anyway that's it and just wanted to show you that we have all those fancy features available in here as well not just in the dancing flames when we're happy with the animation we've created all you have to do is put this into the movie append to movie that'll open up the easy movie maker and here you set your duration if you have multiple um, different sequences and you want to make one big movie you can also have uh, morph between different sequences and here we set up, make sure you change this to 30 if you want to run 30 frames a second or 60 if that's what you want. And let's play it, you know, there's your preview. If you want to check any frames and see what it'll come out like approximately, you can just go in and go to a frame, click on render, it'll do a quick preview. So that's what the flame's going to be looking like when it's rendered to a frame, proper frame as part of the animation in output. So when that's done, all you have to do is generate a sequence. You can actually go straight to images, but in this case we're going to go flames and actually create the flame files, which is basically just simple XML text-based stuff. So this is quick. Generate sequence, basically ask you, um, first of all, for a um, we'll call it test, a folder, Give it a name. As you can see, it doesn't take long. Then what you do is you go into Batch Flame Renderer, and here you see I've already rendered this. You can see sort of previews. Each one of these frames running at very low quality, which is about quality of about 200. I can check that here on a second. Very low quality. I can check what it says here. Quality is 200. Quality 200 is uh, more than enough for uh, video, generally speaking. Uh, it's actually overkill by about double. Or, you know, you can get away with running at about 50 quality. The quality is a measurement that's to do with how many iterations it's running for each frame before you actually call it quits. 
So the higher the number, the longer the render will take. As I said, when we bring in the GPU rendering, this will be uh, cut down to seconds, like one or two seconds should have done that one. That's how, if you look at my previous video, that's how much the difference will be. Right, so I've rendered the whole sequence of ping images, and all of these will now be waiting and ready. Okay, I'm just going to very quickly show you how to create a video from a sequence of PNG files, ping files that we created out of JWildfire. As I mentioned earlier, I uh, created this already, and I called it Xenospasm. Now I can drag one of these straight into the flow here. Any one of those um, files will then bring in, in this case it was 120 frames, starting at 0, going to 119. I can drag this into my timeline here and it automatically sets the render uh, end. You see down here it says whatever I'm pointing at. Render end time. Global end time. So um, anyway, once I've selected that like this, deselect and select again, you can see you get your playback. So this is basically playing without any rendering. So this is just playing back from straight from the hard disk and it'll be doing that the second time around at full 30 frames a second. It's basically caching it for the first time. Now, put a loop on that and as you can see now we're playing it at real, real time speed. So that's basically all you have to do. Now, uh, just to show people that might be interested in creating a video from this just drop a saver into the view that we're viewing this on uh, sorry if I view that there first and then drag the saver straight into the viewport it'll then open up and ask me what I want to call it and we'll just call this one uh, what do we call it Xenospasm Xenospasm test dot mp4 and I can if I want to I can set it here as QuickTime movies all movies inside of uh, Fusion currently needs to be set to QuickTime even though you might not use the QuickTime codec but that's why you need to have QuickTime using QuickTime there to as your setting as you can see we can use mp4 dot mov which is QuickTime movies uh, default format is actually identical to mp4 so you can change the file extension from one to the other and they still play so that's just a little trick you might be interested in all right so once that's done i can just hit render and that'll output let's see here h264 is the standard quality 75 i can set that to whatever i want but that's fine so it didn't about 10 frames a second so basically now I have that yeah, I can deselect and select again and that's actually playing back the video at this point all right so that's all it takes to create a video in fusion now that's uh, the end of this section in a separate video I will go through how we do dancing flames that's when we're using sound sync and that is where things get even more exciting. Okay, while well, you're watching the loop that I created here, um, this is the video I rendered out in Fusion, just to kind of finish off. As you can see, uh, it was a randomly generated fractal that I created in J Wildfire and um, animated as you saw there in the video. Nothing particularly hard about it, and it loops pretty nice as well. Anyway, if you join me in the next video, what you're going to see is how I create a complete music video animation with live mixing, etc. for a seven and a half minute track. Okay, we'll see you at the next video.